And, and I have a word for the church tonight because there's some good stuff going on. Some good stuff happening. There's a spirit of revival here. And I wasn't even here and God talked to me about it. Revival is within us. Harvest is out there. Okay. So when we have, it's just like farmers. When you, if you're going to go out and get the harvest, you got to get strong. You got to eat your meat and potatoes that grandma's made in the farmhouse. And then you got to go out and bring in the harvest. So we have to be strong and we have to be growing to go get the harvest. So there's revival and harvest happening. And I want us to be on the same page in order to go out into the, into the master's field. And who is he? Who is he? Who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? He is our master, Jesus Christ. And he is our, he is the rabbi. Amen. He is the one in charge. So let's read in our Bibles at 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. I, want, I just want to talk to you of some things in my heart about overcoming hindrances to the spiritual growth of the church and being able to walk in revival, walk in harvest and in spiritual renewal. And so I just, this is not going to come across necessarily as a sermon, but I'm just going to be talking to you from my heart for the next few moments. And uh, I'm very excited that the Lord lets me to start in two weeks from tonight the doctrines of David. And I think I'll have four weeks to share with you the four of the doctrines of David. Uh, and I'm super excited about that because David, David was pretty awesome. And we need to have the spirit of David. 2 Corinthians 10, 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So if you wanted to whoop the devil... Your gun would not help you. The bomb would not help you. The bomb in that plane, the missile, the missile, you know, you can have all these things. But the Pentagon, the Pentagon can bring all of its cruisers together. You know, it's uh, floating cities and none of it would do anything to the devil. But so, so it, in addition to the devil, this passage of scripture is not just talking about the devil, it's talking about our minds. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations, everybody says, that's the mind. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Brother James, did you pray over this message? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. 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 Say it. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that we have open ears to what you're going to give us, Lord God. That we will receive it, Lord God, and walk in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Thanks for standing. You may be seated. So I want to talk about hindrances to the spiritual growth of the church for just a few moments. So on Friday, and, and you, you can look at me like I'm crazy. That wouldn't be the first time. But I was, I, every day I, I would get up around 530 and with a little Little, pull a little wagon with fishing equipment to the beach and uh, before the sun rose I would be out this deep at the sandbar so you go in every beach in the world is the same uh, unless it's had a storm recently but the, after a while the waves create three gutters three troughs so I go through the first trough and cast a uh, cast net and catch fish and those are those are called white bait and some of them were white bait. Some of them were, were sand perch. I caught a baby catfish. And anyway, they're little. We call them minnows, fingerlings. And then I would take them out to the sandbar through the first trough. And after a while, you're up about this deep and all of a sudden your, heat, your feet hit sand and then you start rising up again after the drop off. And there you are on the sandbar about 30 yards away from the ocean. And I, I looked on Friday morning and I looked over to my left and there were... Uh, this was Saturday morning, and there were two black tip sharks about 20 yards away from me. And then there were dolphins. Every day there were dolphins swimming around me, and sometimes Rachel would come out with coffee to watch the sunrise. So that's the time of day that the fish are doing their most feeding. And so um, at the sunrise I was out there and I was casting these little white baits, and, and the two sharks came up and they were hunting or fishing, whatever you want to call it. 
and they were in, hunting around the sandbar and fishing for the same fish that I was going for. And I looked at him, I didn't immediately get concerned, but I believe the Lord got concerned because um, I backed up a little bit and I just kind of watched because sharks don't usually show their fins. If you see fins, it's usually dolphins. Sharks are usually right under you and you never see them 99% of the time. And it may not have been those sharks that were the problem, but something happened. There was no wind. There were no clouds. Pretty much the whole time we were there, there were hardly any clouds. And all of a sudden, and this is the, this is the calmest beach I've ever been on. And all of a sudden, uh, and there because there were hardly any waves, because it, Sanibel Island creates kind of a bay. So the, the water is just coming in slowly, even though it is the, the Atlantic Ocean slash Gulf of Mexico. And so all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the water that I'm standing in got rough. There was no boat going by. You know how on the lake the boat going by will create waves. There was no wake. There was no parasailer. There was no wind. I'm telling you, as, as God is my witness, there was no wind. All of a sudden, the water just started rushing from where I was onto the beach. And I started. we started getting waves. And so I got out of the water because it got a little rough for me to even be able to fish. And I sat there stunned for about 25 minutes watching the waves come from nowhere that I hadn't seen all week long. And the, the Lord began to, to impress me about the angel that descended once a year to the, the pool of Bethesda and troubled the waters and the people that got in after the angel, the first person that got in after the angel troubled the waters would get healed because of the, the power of the Spirit. And so... Uh, I believe that the Lord was protecting me from something. It may have been the sharks, it may have been for something else, but the water was troubled. And after about 25 minutes, I, the, it was gone. The wave was gone. We never had any wind the whole time. It was a very strange thing. I, I want you to know that the Lord is watching out for us in the church. He's looking out for us, and He is looking out to help us. But there will always be things that will cause us trouble. There will always be things that will cause, you know, you'll always have your sharks swimming in the waters of the church trying to cause trouble. And if we want to see revival, we've got to make sure we watch out for these pitfalls and that we have a spirit of unity. And I want you to be blessed. I want to be blessed. And I want us all to be blessed together. I just want us all to get in the big old blessing basket and not get out of it. I want us to get in the ark and not get out of it. I don't want us to jump out of the ark because we think we can make it better swimming. I want us to stay in the ark of salvation and to be protected of the Lord. So the Bible tells us that in order to do that, we have to cast down our own thoughts sometimes. Understanding that the things of this world that we feel like might protect us really can't protect us very much spiritually. we got to get our minds right, cast down those imaginations. And the Bible uses the term casting down to make you think of an idol and to make you think of people like Hezekiah that went around casting down idols. Hezekiah even went all the way back to the brazen serpent from Moses' day that Moses made in obedience to God. The Bible says Israel went a whoring after that brazen serpent. And so he burnt it and cast it over the book, Brook Kidron and called it Nahushtan. And he said, it's nothing. It's no good. Stop worshiping the thing that Moses made to protect you and to heal you from snakes because Moses didn't want you to worship that serpent. He wanted you to worship God. And so this is the same thought when Jehoshaphat cast down idols and, and Jehu cast down Baal and killed the priests of Baal and, and Jezebel. We got to have that kind of zeal within ourselves and make sure that we don't allow any kind of thought to come into our mind that would be a hindrance of spiritual growth. This is a scripture that says bringing into captivity everything and the things that will exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Can you think of another scripture which talks of somebody or something that exalts itself against the knowledge of the holy? Anybody think of it? You can say it. It's... The devil absolutely did that. And then who is coming? The Antichrist. And 1 Thessalonians talks about the Antichrist. That Sister, Sister Lynn said, he is possessed by the devil, the scriptures tell us. And so the Antichrist in 1 Thessalonians says, he exalts himself against all that is of God. 
And so if we let our, our minds exalt themselves against the church and the way God has things set in order in the church, the order of the spirit, the order of authority in the church, the order of love one for another, the order of working well together. You know, the church works well together. Just like all of those cogs in the engine, when the grease is right and the specifications are right, everything is working well together. We don't want to exalt ourselves against another cog or against the fire of the Holy Ghost. When everything is working well together, one thing doesn't say, well, I want to be better than that. Paul talked about that. Well, I'm the foot. But I would rather be the eye. We want to make sure we don't let that come into our minds because the Bible reveals to us that is the spirit of Antichrist. And if we have that spirit, when the real capital A Antichrist comes on the scene, we will be deceived. I can be deceived. If I have a preacher up here, think about myself and say, well, I didn't get this. It didn't work out for me the way I wanted it to. I have to cast that down. And, and it will happen. And I hope that you're reading. The, some of you maybe have got Brother Sleva's book. And I've got several copies. If you want to buy it, just a don donation of any amount. I think I got the, bought the church three copies. Um, and uh, you'll read it. Brother Sleva talks about it in, in his interview. He says, what? And he just preached for us. This is Sister Thone's nephew. Said what, brother? Brother Turner said, "What do you struggle with?" Brother Turner is the missionary to Russia that wrote the book, and he said, "I struggle with pride." And I have never in my life thought that Jim Sleeve has struggled with pride, but he was honest to say that people he has done good things for God, and people say good things about him, and so he has to fight that pride. We need to be honest with ourselves about our imaginations and say, "This is what I struggle with. I don't want anything to get in the way of revival." Uh, someone read 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 through 14. I think that's Brother Kyle. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them, the favor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish, or admonish you, excuse me. <clears throat> and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the evil-minded, support the weak, be patient for all men. Okay, so here I was out there in the ocean. The best way to avoid sharks is not with a weapon or anything else. The best way to avoid sharks or to avoid trouble with sharks is with knowledge. Because if the shark comes up, because you know most of the time people that have encounters with sharks never know they have encounters with sharks. Okay? Most of the time people don't see them. When they see a fin, they think it's a shark, it's usually a dolphin. So, And I saw tons of dolphins. Dolphins were hanging out. They act like they want to play. It was pretty cool. So... The, you have the knowledge and understand that if, if something brushes up against you, you know, go. Aah! And back in the in the mid 20th century, they used to give people on ships and in lifeboats shark repellent. Well, it turns out it didn't work. And in some cases, it actually drew sharks to people because it put a marker on them. The best way to deal with things in the church is to have a knowledge of God and to know each other, to have knowledge of each other. And so we have to be very careful when people come into the church that are new in the Lord and are hungry. We have to care for them. We have to love them and treat them the way that babies should be treated with love and tender care. But then there are some people that come in that don't want to act like babies. that want to come in and say, I know everything. I want to cause problems. I want to yak and I want to talk and I want to do this and I want to badmouth this and badmouth this person and badmouth the pastor. You've got to watch for sharks. You have knowledge and understand, okay, well, the best way to deal with that is to say, you know what? I'm going to admit for a while that the ocean in this area at least is your territory. And I'm going to back away from it because you're seven foot long and you've got big old shoulders and you're a bull shark. And your teeth, there's more teeth in your head than I've ever had in my lifetime. So I'm going to give you the space. Back away from it. We have to be careful about those things because I'm going to tell you something. Someone that comes in the church speaking with a bad spirit, they're a shark. 
They're predatory. That's a predatory spirit. And that person does not know what spirit they are of nine times out of ten. Unless, even if someone was possessed of the devil, that person does not understand, generally speaking, what they are dealing with and what is, is, is messing with them. And so if there is revival in us, we must prepare to go forth into the harvest. That includes me. I have to be prepared by having a right spirit. I have to ask questions like, do I have a right spirit? And, and that starts with asking this question, am I walking daily in the Savior's light? How is my walk with Him? How is my connection with Him? Do I have a right spirit? Is my connection with the Lord based only on my needs? Now we know we're supposed to take our needs to the Lord. But in Sunday school we learn about the prayer sandwich. And the two pieces of bread are different forms of praise in which we're verbally acknowledging Him. My relationship with Him isn't just supposed to be gimme, 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 gimme. Okay, and I used to love when I was a kid. Used to love to watch the, the uh, Cosby Show, and I listened a lot when I was a kid growing up to to Bill Cosby's stand-up comedy. And he said that while he was raising his kids, he taught them, "My name is Dad. My name is not Dad. Can I have?" <laughs> And this is what it's like being a parent. You understand? The kids are always gimme, 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 gimme. But as, you, as your kids grow up and they have their own lives, the relationship matures. And hopefully you can be, you know, you can have a deeper relationship when the kids realize that you're not just Daddy Warbucks. Okay, nobody here knows who Daddy Warbucks is. But if you've seen Annie, you know the dad. I, I got to quit using these old fashioned analogies. And probably half of you don't know who Bill Cosby is. So anyway, anyway. Somebody that has everything and they just you're just always asking, is your relationship with God just gimme, gimme, gimme? Dad, can I? Dad, can I have? Dad, can I have? Dad, can I have? Or is your relationship based on, I love your presence, Jesus. I want to commune with you, Jesus. Yes, we're told to tell him of our needs. Yes, we're supposed to ask him for forgiveness and we're supposed to forgive others. We're supposed to pray for his will to be done. But we're also supposed to praise him and love him and worship him. What kind of relationship do we have with Jesus? And we'll get a good spirit that will grow out of that. Am I holding back from following what I've been taught in some areas? I might be a hindrance to revival. If I'm holding back, I've got an area that I just, I just can't quite yield that over to Jesus. My, my grandpa was called to preach, but he had an area in his life. His, he's the one we named Nicholas after, Nick Alexander Hush. And he was, my dad and my whole family knows the area that he was offended in early on in his walk with God. And my grandmother, his wife, lived for God all the days of her life and prayed with an unsaved husband until three months before he died. And he died young with a heart attack and no one knew it was coming. It was a massive coronary. So he didn't know it was three months. But my Uncle Paul and someone else went out in the country and had a talk with him and prayed. And he had a time of repentance, I am told. But his entire life he avoided living for God because he got sideways about an issue in the church. He he became a hindrance and he couldn't go to church anymore so he was hindering himself so am I holding back or am I surrendering to Jesus there's only one way to live with Jesus live for Jesus and that's 100% surrendered so I am I all in everybody say all in for Jesus you know all in for Jesus and all in for church it's the same thing because we can't live for Jesus without the church. And we can't live for Jesus without a pastor. And even I have a pastor. And I have multiple pastors. And I've even gone out and I've found another preacher that doesn't have any position of authority over me. Brother David Mathis. And I've said, I want you to be my pastor too. And so he's not my presbyter. He's not someone that I have to obey. But I have asked him to, to oversee me as a minister. So even I have a pastor. Everybody's got to have a pastor. So I can't cancel out my relationship with Jesus by having a bad relationship with the church and say, I want to be strong for Jesus, but I don't want to be strong for the church. It doesn't work that way because the church is the body of Christ and he is the head of the church. And if I've got a problem with the pastor, I've got a problem with Jesus. So I need to make sure that I have a right spirit. We need to understand that when we are in a, in a time of harvest and revival, we need to keep a teachable spirit. Because if I'm unteachable, then I'm unreachable. 
And we need to understand that we don't ever get to a place or age or time of maturity or experience where we don't need to be taught. I'm never going to get to that place and neither are you. Unreachable and unteachable are the same thing. This is a, a lot of stuff from a pastor's perspective. And I'm showing you how much I love you tonight by sharing with you things that are just genuinely straight from my heart. Uh, my personal walk with God is directly connected to my decision to submit or not to submit to God's authority. My walk with God is directly connected to my decision to say yes to God's authority in my life or no to God's authority in my life. Which means if I say yes and submit, I'm going to be close to Jesus. I'm going to have the ability to be close to Jesus. If I say no, I'm not going to be able to be close to Jesus. And that is through your pastor. That's where that authority is placed in your life. Someone... Uh, I think I, I did not give this scripture. So look at 2 Corinthians 13 and 10. 2 Corinthians 13 and 10. Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness. He said, my letters and my distance away from you is toning down <laughs> what, I'm what I'm saying. That's what Paul said. According to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. So if we are in the church, it's God's will for us to be edified. Do you know what edified means? It means grow. It means grow. So if the building is edified, it means that we have done some remodeling. If this church, we decided we want to get rid of the vinyl siding and make it brick, I'm sure that would be beautiful, but we wouldn't be able to do it with one brick and it wouldn't happen in one day. It would take many bricks. It would take the destruction of this siding and the hiring of a mason and being able to put that brick around the building and the building would be edified. Its value would go up because brick is more valuable than other types of construction. And the building would be beautified, but it would take work. The building would grow. Okay. And God bless us someday when we get to 75% capacity, which would be probably about 80 people in this building it's time for us to go this way or this way or this way with the building we'd have to push it out it would mean some destruction of some things and breaking out of some walls but the stretching and so if we come to church and think we're not supposed to be edified then we have got the wrong idea about church we've got to be teachable and if I want to be reachable by Jesus I need to be teachable from my pastor Paul said, I would that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you for it is reported uh, to us by the, them of the house of Chloe that there be divisions among you. We're not supposed to have divisions. We're supposed to have unity. And unity is also on the road to uniformity. And uniformity and uniform, see, the same root. We're supposed to think similarly and act similarly. We're supposed to be here for the same reason. And that reason is to fulfill the cause of Jesus Christ. And it is a good cause. Someone read 2 Peter 2, 9 through 10. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to preserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. But to you be them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despised government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Okay. And also, please, Sister Lynn, read Jude 1 and 8, if you can find it. <laughs> that was awful small. <laughs> Likewise, also these filthy dreamers who follow the flesh and the eyes of the man that speak evil of dignities. Okay, so everybody say, pettiness is the enemy of the Holy Ghost. Pettiness is the enemy of the Holy Ghost. So if I'm in church life and I think first about myself, I'm doing it wrong. When I'm in church, I should be thinking about the needs of the church first, which means I'm thinking about others. I'm thinking about the church as a whole. If I come to church and I'm thinking, I'm not saying you're not going to come to church and say, I need a touch from Jesus tonight. That is not what I'm saying. And I think you all know that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if I get petty and say, I can't. I won't. I don't know how to do that. I don't like that. 
and stand in the way and become a resistance to what I'm trying to do as your pastor. And when I say me, I'm talking also about my wife. Then I'm getting in the way of what God wants to do. And that is, it's a, the scripture tells us it's a dangerous thing to speak out against the ministry. This, these passages are directly talking about people that badmouth the ministry or stand in the way of the ministry. I need to come to church thinking first about Jesus, second about the church, third about the ministers in the church, the needs of others in the church, and I come way last down at the bottom of that list. That's the way I need to be. And that's the spirit of revival. That will create in me a servant's heart. David had a servant's heart to God and to the nation of Israel. He was willing to give his life as a teenager for Israel just to kill Goliath because he was offended at the way he was talking about the armies of the God of Israel. Not the armies of Israel, but the armies of the God of Israel. He said, whom thou hast defied. So I need to go into the Word of God and figure out what's more important, my feelings or the doctrines of the Bible? What do you think is more important? The doctrines of the Bible, what the Bible teaches. And I know and I commend you, I commend you, I commend you, I commend you many times over for coming to the house of the Lord when you are being pressured by culture and by everything that's online and at social media, by conversations with other people, and by the pressure of the world we live in. You're being pressured to, to believe that you're a victim in all things. But when you come to church, I'm going to preach truth. I'm not going to talk about victimhood. I'm going to say you're a victor in Jesus Christ. I'm going to preach and I'm going to challenge you. Brother Brandon, Brother Jones, those people that come here, they're going to challenge you to walk in faith and to believe that you are able to step up and be more than what your flesh wants to be, but to be what God wants you to be, to walk on a higher plane. And so your feelings come under the subjection to this right here, this, these Bible doctrines, the way I feel. I don't want to pray right now. I don't want to go to church. I don't feel like doing that. I don't, I'm not going to let the Lord have that area of my life. Those are feelings and they are imaginations. And the Bible says, what, were, what are we supposed to do with the idols of the imagination? Cast them down. Tear them down. Get rid of that brazen serpent. And so I want to make sure that I think about the church first. What is the church? What is important? When I leave this place, I'm representing the church. And so how I act is to represent the church. Um, I, I know that we're constantly, the, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians that we are unwise by measuring ourselves amongst ourselves and comparing ourselves amongst ourselves. This is unwise. But you and I are constantly having other churches pushed in our face because of social media. And a little bit of sermon watching and music listening to is a good thing. But you need to understand that our church is not that other church, even if it's a UPC church. And your pastor is not that pastor. And that pastor is not your pastor. That pastor doesn't know anything about your life and he probably doesn't want to. So if we're always looking at other churches, moment by moment, second by second, and comparing with this one, no one is ever going to be able to compete with that. That's not helpful. And Paul said it's not wise. If you want to know what an unhealthy church is, and if you want to know what an unhealthy ministry is, it's your pastor and the people in the church that are always running around to this conference, to this YouTube video and saying, let's do that. Let's do that. That's what somebody else is doing. And we're going to sit down at a conference and we're going to sit, up, sit down at Chili's and we're going to talk about this is what you're doing. This is what I'm doing. And we're going to go and adopt that thing. Never ever talking about or looking at the New Testament, specifically the epistles, which actually tell us how to do church. The Bible tells us how to do church. We don't need to go constantly comparing ourselves among ourselves. You know why? Because every town is different. Every church is a little different. And I may get a few ideas here and there. You know, Sunday school is one of those ideas that is not in the New Testament. Came from the Methodist movement. It has stood the test of time. It's a good idea. I'm not saying it's wrong to adopt youth ministry. Not in the New Testament, although there are some there's some hints at youth ministry and children's ministry in the New Testament. These are some things. Of course, there's going to be some good ideas, but it will it will cause the pastor's brain to melt. <laughs> and as speaking as somebody whose brain has melted before. 
and has become solidified now because I just got back from vacation. <laughs> Don't make it melt again. If we're constantly trying to compare ourselves, oh, we're going to go do this, we're going to do this. It never ends. It never ends. It never ends. And so I feel like we're we're fairly technologically advanced church and we're saving up, working towards a new sound system. There's a lot of improvements we want to make, a lot of good ideas, but let's do it in the time that God ordains it. Okay? And, and there's there's a movement out there that, that's just this constant. We've got to constantly change everything to try to keep up with the Joneses. We're keeping up with Jesus. Yeah, not the Joneses. Okay? Nothing against Brother Jones. Okay. So it's very sad. For, second of all, what's wrong with constantly going and comparing ourselves with other people is not is because you miss out on the fellowship. We need to be able to be with people at camp and at, at conferences and stuff and just enjoy each other's company without feeling the pressure, <laughs> this constant pressure. How many people are you running? I don't care how many people in other churches running. And I don't want to tell anybody, but I'm running the people in our church that God wants to be in our church. The Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved for Harris, Minnesota. And so we are missing out on fellowship when we're feeling pressure. So ask ourselves these questions. Can I learn? Can I be taught? Am I resisting? Am I a shark in the waters? Or am I listening to the whisperings of a shark in the waters? Then if I'm resisting, I don't understand how to be a follower of Jesus. And I'm not a saint. Because a saint understands submission. Submission to Jesus, servanthood, walking with God. When we come into the church, we become disciples of Jesus, which means we are following Jesus. We are not leading Jesus around like some type of errand runner, UPS, speedy delivery, whatever. We're not leading Jesus around asking him, go do this, do this, do this. Jesus is leading us. He's leading us in places where we can't see, where the eyes can't see. He's walking with us and His hand is leading us. And we used to sing that song back in the church, the hand that I can see leading me. When we are coming to church, we're taking a stand. And when you live for Jesus, you're taking a stand. Taking a stand is not supposed to be easy or comfortable. Okay? So there will be times of discomfort in following the gospel. The gospel is not easy and it's not comfortable. Okay? It's reasonable, but the gospel is not easy on the flesh. It's easy on our spirit because His way is easy and His burden is light. But it's not easy on our flesh because it involves resistance to what the flesh wants to do and to the world. It, it involves not fitting in with this world. So, if I say, I don't like in the church, it could be just a common statement and not a problem. It could be me hindering what the church wants to do because I'm not submitting to it. So when we have events, it's not about you and it's not about me. Sister Rachel and I, we, we put the calendar together and we, we've got a team and I'm thankful for all of that. Remember that when we do things and we have events, it's not about you. Sometimes we're going to have theme events, which means we need to work together and follow the schedule and follow the plan and not try to stand up and be a shark, whether it's a mama shark or a daddy shark or a baby shark. We don't need to be swimming around the waters causing problems. We need to submit. OK, one day when I was fishing, uh, a, I saw the waters boiling on the beach, absolutely boiling for about 40 feet. And the boiling of the waters was moving in my direction. And I was like, I'm about to catch some fish. This is about to happen for me. And an older man, probably about 85, was walking by, enjoying the sunrise. And he said, that's mullet. And he said, if you cast your net, you'll catch them and carry them out and uh, you'll catch something bigger. And uh, I've got another story for you because I did catch something bigger. Actually, it caught me. Um, that was my second encounter with a shark. But I caught, I cast my net and I caught at least seven mullets. And each one of them was between half a pound and a pound. And so when I cast that net, it's a it's a cast net and you cinch it up the the entire net started vibrating because I had seven fish in it maybe eight and they get bigger every time I tell a story <laughs> it was it was absolutely amazing but they were a school 
Now there's some fish that are in packs, some fish that are loners, some fish that go out by tools, twos, but a school of fish has a single mind. If you've ever seen them on a documentary or ever been in been snorkeling, you've seen schools of fish. They flow and they just like the blackbirds, okay? Uh, not I'm not talking about like a flock of geese because they're they're working together as a team and they're calling to each other. But blackbirds, which is starlings, greckles, and um, European cowbirds. They're called blackbirds. We don't have that many of them up here, but in the south, they're everywhere and they make everything nasty and then you can teach them to talk and all that. But when you see them flow, they're flowing like one organism. That is the church, okay? Sheep do that. Only a few animals do that. When we're following Jesus, okay, and, and the fish was one of the symbols of the early church, we're supposed to flow like that. As one mind, one organism, amen? When we get, I feel the helper right now, when we get the mind of Christ, it's no big deal for us to flow just like those, those fish were flowing when I was casting that net. And we will go forth and we will cast our nets and we will be fishers of men. Just like Jesus said to Peter, he was going to make him follow me. When you follow Jesus, amen, you're flowing like a river in the church. There's no resistance. There's only peace. There will be problems. There will be lemons. But God will give you sugar and you'll make lemonade and everything will be all right. Because we just keep on flowing. We just keep on moving. We just keep walking in the, in the path of the Savior. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. We're taking a stand. There's no time for I don't like or I can't. If I don't like it, learn to like it. If I can't do it, then learn how to do it. <laughs> Those little things, though they be little, can greatly hinder God's move in the community within the church. So let's make sure that we get rid of all forms of pettiness in our lives. When, when a shark enters the church, and I'll begin to, to wrap it up because I'm done. A shark enters the church or, or comes around the church. And, and five things have happened in the last month and, uh, that have, and I, I'm not going to mention them, but five things have happened. Two of them were good and three of them were negative. And I, I watch those things and I'm sensitive to those things because I'm supposed to be up here on overlooking you and the church as a, as a shepherd, you know. And I'm supposed to be watching for those things. And I see that movement. It tells me God is working and the devil is working to stop it. So if I talk about the pastor, if I talk negative about things that are happening or allow pettiness to come into my mind, if, if that goes any further than just a, a very little bit and I don't repent of it, the Bible talks about that opening the door for demons. And I don't want that to come into your life and I don't want it to come into my life. So no resistance. We're just schooling together, following Jesus, following him, flowing with no hindrances to the gospel, letting the gospel have its perfect way. The death, the burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ working in me. And if I will get a hold of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ every day in prayer, every day walking in that baptism where I was washed not going back into the sin, but staying in the washing. Every day going back into repentance. Forgive me my debts as I forgive my, get my debtors. Don't have anything against other people. Have a right spirit. Praying in the spirit and with the understanding. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Letting truth come into our lives. That will allow us to flow in the same direction for revival. I'm telling you, we, you there's a lot of good things coming up and there's, there's, there's positive changes happening in the church and I want us to make sure we are on the right on the same page. And I want to make sure that page is in this book. And if you don't know what that book is, it's the Bible. Praise the Lord. The Lord shows us how. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I glorify your name. I praise your name, Jesus. You're worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be praised. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I don't want glory, Lord Jesus. How can, I think about that song by Andre Crouch. How can I say thanks for the things that you've done for me? Things so undeserved and you gave to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels cannot express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be belong to you. To God be the glory for the things he has done. 
If I get that in my mind, Brother James, I want him to have the glory. The things that can happen in this world, if people don't care who gets the glory, if people don't care who gets the glory, God can do all kinds of stuff. And we can just hang out over here in the shadows because we're content with our lives and we don't need the spotlight on us and just enjoying it. God is so good. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's just love him one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed is your name, Lord.